Good morning, everybody, and welcome at EAU TV. We're here in Milan together with my uh, colleagues, uh, Dr. Tutolo from Milan and Professor here from London. And uh, we will discuss uh, the topics uh, on, on bladder cancer, non-muscle invasive and muscle invasive bladder cancer. And we will reflect on the session we just had. And I would love to start with Professor here because you uh, finished the last session and it was a lively discussion at, at the last uh, moment. And uh, I would like to invite you to reflect on uh, the trial you conducted in the UK, the photo trial. And uh, maybe we can uh, start off the discussion with that. Uh, thank you. Yeah, I think we had a very provocative counter debate at the end of my session, which um, I think provides a great platform to embrace a deeper discussion about the nature of the study. The study shows that if we compare PDD, photodynamic diagnosis, guided reception for intermediate and high-risk non-muscle invasive bladder cancer, that we can, we, we th hypothetically, we should be able to reduce recurrences based on previous studies. The surprising finding, which I think some of the audience found unpalatable, was that we didn't see a difference. And I think that partly reflects two complementary biologies that are in play in accounting for recurrence in non-muscle invasive bladder cancer. The first one is the focus of the trial, which is the incomplete resection of tumor leads to recurrence because there's residual disease, missed disease, incomplete resection. It's thought that that might only account for 20, possibly at the most 40% of recurrence. But I think what this study shows is that in the longer term, the early effects that we might see from better resection are lost because there's another biology at play, which is that the urethelium in bladder remains vulnerable for transformation. And over time, that then becomes the predominant factor leading to a recurrence and therefore no difference between white light and PDD resection. And you ended your talk with a question to the audience. Will you still be using PDD? Maybe... Dr. Toro, you could comment on that if you... Actually, this is the, the, the focus, I think, because we should also apply what we find in our studies on our everyday clinical practice. I think that, again, here, probably the selection of the patient uh, is of utmost importance in choosing which patient can benefit of this kind of procedure or uh, not. So... Um, I wouldn't be so strict in telling, okay, no PDD anymore, but maybe choose the best candidate for this kind of approach. And it was real, uh, you depicted it was real world uh, clinical data. Uh, and uh, do you think there's a, some kind of learning curve also in, in, um, in, in PDD procedures for urologists? I think we got a signal that that was the case. Mm. Um, very early on, what we saw was a divergence in the curves, indicating perhaps there was some gain in undertaking PDD. We think that might be related to a learning curve phenomena, where it's not necessarily learning PDD that's the issue, is that once you become more experienced in PDD, then it makes your white light resection better. So as we do PDD, we look around the bladder in normal white light setting, and then when you turn on the blue light, you may spot a tumor you've missed. It makes you more vigilant. Mm -hmm. So if you're doing white light alone, it plausibly makes you better. There's a signal in the data for that, and that's a publication to follow. Okay, okay. thank you. Well, suppose we uh, have a female patient who recurs and recurs with muscle invasive disease. Then we come to the topic of the uh, the other topics of the session, and uh, uh, we I would like to focus more a little bit on female patients with muscle invasive bladder cancer and candidates for cystectomy, sexual sparing, so, uh, so resolvement of complications. Um, Manuela, could you um, reflect on that? Uh, you gave an excellent talk on that yeah. topic. Actually, it's very interesting that is. Uh, almost 20 years that we are talking about complications after neobladder and we want to go into depth of the neobladder surgery for women, but we still have the same complications, the same literature to rely on. And this is a pity because we see in our everyday clinical life that we have uh, roughly 25% of patients affected by this type of cancer. And we see that they are old, 
with a good performance status and they require um, functional uh, outcomes that can reflect this improvement in quality of life or in life ex expectancy. So it's really important that we uh, correctly and properly assess these patients um, with a, a proper surgical uh, approach choosing the best approach for this specific patient, for that specific patient, and also um, informing patients up front about the risk of complications according to the risk factor of the uh, single patients that we are going to treat. So, in general, it's not good to... Uh, be reluctant in counseling patient, female patients for um, new bladder surgery. But we should do that there are complications with this kind of surgeries and we should know which kind of complication we can get involved in and counsel our patients according to the risk of that complications mm -hmm. yeah. when we plan uh, orthotopic new bladder reconstruction. And Nick James showed uh, data from the UK that there, uh, the proportion of patients receiving a neobladder is around 10 to 12 percent, or that it's declining, maybe due to introduction of the the robot and the learning curves of the of the urologist. But what do you think, um, Professor Hur, on on the yeah proportion of patients suitable for neobladder, and male or female? Yeah, I think what we're now seeing is uh, a new paradigm emerging which Manuel has been championing here, which is to go beyond the oncological outcomes. And in particular for urologists, our focus on delivering high quality technical surgery mm -hmm. to, deliver, to deliver those outcomes. Um, we've seen an adoption of robotics. There's been a transition, some reluctance, but as we start seeing more and more people do robotics, the experience grow. The technical ability has also expanded. Mm -hmm. So I think we're starting to see now more and more patients being offered intercorporeal reconstructions with a robot. In my own center, that's now becoming the standard way which we deliver cystectomy and also reconstruction. We have intercorporeal ileal chondry formation, intercorporeal orthotopic reconstruction. A bit more work needs to be done to disseminate that technical experience throughout the country. But I think with that, we'll see more and more patients become plausible for them to Mm -hmm. uh, an orthotopic reconstruction. And 10% maybe is not a bad thing. It might reflect very careful case selection. Yep. But I suspect as we look, maybe look at younger patients, that number will probably increase. Okay. And Geraldine Pignot uh, depicted uh, that uh, uh, conservation of the vascular um, uh, vasculature for the uh, vaginal wall is very important and also nerve sparing also in females. And what's your opinion on that? Uh... Actually, it's really important to preserve these structures, especially in young women um, asking for a normal sexual life after uh, surgery, but also to prevent uh, other complications like incontinence or or prolapse, because we know that maintaining the structures of the pelvic floor can preserve also the the, the natural balance of these structures um, after surgery. So it's really important that if we can have a good cancer control in these patients, preserving these structures, we do it good. She said, yep. if you do yep. this kind of surgery, do it good. And do it good means preserve good vascularization, don't injure too much the vaginal wall. Mm -hmm. And uh, this can help in preserving sexual and voiding function in these patients. Is the risk uh, of, a, of, a, of a prolapse larger if, if the uterus is not present anymore in, in females? Actually, yes, yeah. because um, uh, preserving structures, we know that in f female in general, um, um, mm, a great part of the balance of the pelvic floor is due um, uh, thanks to the relationship between organs of the pelvic floor. So, in general, maintaining these structures like uterus can preserve uh, uh, um, uh, the, 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 the bladder maintenance of a kind of balance, uh, so without the possibility of prolapse. But it depends on the patient we have in front of us.
And we, di we generally dissect the urethra as well eh, in, in female patients, but I understood from your talk that the clitoris is also at risk then for denervation and, and, and that has impact on the sexual function afterwards. But uh, what's your opinion on the counseling of, of female patients? Um, I think we should be careful with female patients because we... Uh, should think and take into account about different um, aspects of female voiding dysfunction and psychological um, assessment uh, connected to cancer, um, to, to the news of having cancer or um, um, in general cancer related or to the fear of not having any more sexual intercourses. So I think the approach for female patients should be, as well as in male patients, but should be for sure a multidisciplinary approach up front, not only after surgery. So uh, urologists, yes, but also psychologists, psychiatrists, physiotherapists, and other figures that can help uh, these patients to, to, to improve the outcome because it's known that the better the counsel, the better the outcome. So you mentioned, mentioned psychiatric yes. uh, counseling and we had a talk of a, a psychiatric um, colleague from uh, Toronto, Christian Schultz, um, and uh, he also stressed that, uh, that, that that's very important that uh, we, we take into account that what we, yeah, what we do with surgery has can have great impact on the psychiatric well-being of the patient. What, how do you do that in, in uh, your institution? Um, uh, w what we do is we spend quite a long time in that initial consultation with the patient. Um, we want to go beyond just explaining the technical endeavor. Mm -hmm. We spend some time trying to explain to the patient what the consequences may be uh, beyond having the initial treatment and living with that diagnosis. Uh, we have nurse specialists that come in they provide that holistic support. Mm -hmm. We have dedicated stoma nurses as well who will provide care in and around and management in and around what they can expect with their stoma or with their uh, orthotopic reconstruction. Uh, the, the challenge is actually there's no good framework that mm -hmm. exists. Mm -hmm. And I think what we saw today in the session was this fantastic spotlight being thrown onto uh, a, a part of the surgery, which I, I think has been neglected. Mm -hmm. um, it certainly gave me a huge amount of enthusiasm to see uh, a number of experts talking about how important that is, in particular, how we put an imbalance in our discussions with men having prostatectomy and their sexual functions, but we don't explore the same um, problems in, in yeah. women. Yeah. So I, I think there's a lot still to be done. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we'd also um, um, a short recaps of Lydia Makarov and, and John Redleff uh, from the patient advocacy um, uh, perspective. And uh, what I uh, found uh, remarkable that they stressed that we as uh, urologists have to, uh, well, well not, not one size does not fit all. Eh? Every patient is unique. Obviously, we, we know that, but we as urologists tend to go dive into technical details on the surgery, etc. But um, the holistic approach you just mentioned is some something we might learn. Exactly. We still have to learn. Or I don't know, here in Milan, how you do it? Um, Actually, when we counsel our patients, we have, um, as I think in Holland, um, a multidisciplinary oncological approach mm. with radiotherapists and oncologists yep. together with the urologists and with the, the, the complex problems of the pelvic floor we have a multidisciplinary approach in terms of functional uh, approach with the neurologists and physiotherapists and gastroenterologists i need we i think we need still to create a link between these two teams yep. to work together in the field of oncology yeah. Uh, do, do you have the impression that a patient, when he, uh, he or she enters uh, the office, and uh, this, uh, it might be a lethal, uh, the cancer might be lethal, and it, the patient is busy with surviving, and that yeah, after, after having survived surgery or, or treatment, that then the psychological aspects of, uh, uh, yeah, are more, more, more there, more present, I mean, than, uh, than surviving cancer. Uh, I always find it difficult in counseling. Eh? And, and, yes, um, it's true. But I think it's human to have to be very worried about your health and telling your doctor, okay, 
uh, let me live but without cancer. Uh, but at the end, when you are happy because your cancer is over, then you need to have a good quality of life. Um, and it's um, quite um, common um, that patients in the first uh, part of the counseling don't care about functional outcome because they are really focused on the tumor problem. Mm -hmm. But I think we should a little bit focus more, even in the first counseling on bladder cancer, about the possibility of continence recovery, of continence problem or sexual problem with this patient because they are... Um, part of their everyday life and we should assess also this before operating them. Yeah, I agree. And do you see there a difference between men and fe male and female patients or in, in the counseling process or? For sure, yeah. for sure. In female patients, we should think about also mm, more about the psychological approach of uh, a young woman, for mm. example, uh, that can have a pro sexual problem after, after uh, surgery. And a good thing could be talk with her and with the partner, okay. not only with her, because there is also a kind of special link um, between the fear of the disease, the fear of the functional outcomes and the fear of not being accepted anymore from the partner. Yeah, yeah. So I think this is... Uh, quite important and it's quite different between men and women. Yeah, good points. Yeah. Um, I forgot my question. Because I, I, uh, yes, yeah, go ahead, Ricky. I just add, yeah, I sure. Think, I think um, some of this um, immediate impact on the patient with the diagnosis takes up the vast majority of that consultation. Mm -hmm. It's a really distressing yes. point yeah. to patient, family, and even as the urologist looking after them. Yes. But we do, in many cases, have quite a long runway where they may go on to have neoadjuvant chemotherapy. So I think there is then scope to go back to the patient mm -hmm. and have an ongoing dialogue yeah. uh, and then build up a, a more realistic expectation of what the surgery may entail um, and living beyond that, that yeah. impact. Yeah. I think it's really critical to create realistic ex expectations. Yeah from patients because they know what they are going through. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So they are not disappointed at the end if they have a kind of complication or sexual uh, problem that you already expla well explained to them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and the other thing I think is really powerful is when they hear about experience from people like them. Exactly. From yeah. other patients. So if there's patient support groups, yeah. I think that can be much more tangible for them hearing about those experiences yeah. as opposed to an account from a doctor. Yeah, yeah, that was one I would like to, wanted to address because that's in the UK uh, very common to, uh, to have... Um... It has been in the hospital I've worked in previously. Okay. Uh, I don't know how widespread it is. Mm. Um, one of the things we did, which I think any, any hospital could do, is keep a uh, log of yeah. patients coming through, ask if they'd be happy to be connected, and we can organically create a patient help group. Yeah that can meet for themselves, survivorship for themselves, but also bring in new people to understand what it's like living as a survivor. Yeah, yeah. well, it was great having you here. Um, if there are no final remarks, then I would like to thank you for your uh, uh, attendance here and also in the contribution to the session. I would like to thank the people at home for watching and I wish you a very pleasant day.